Hello and welcome to the Mount Hope Church podcast. In a world that's dominated by fear, so many people are looking for a sense of security and preservation that they can count on. We're called to awaken a generation. Amen, church? We're awakening a generation to the things of God. We believe that the road to a better life begins with a relationship with Jesus. Join us now for a positive and lifting message that will help you move forward in your walk with Christ. And so Christianity is an active, I like to use sports, it's an active sport. It's, it's, it's your action, you're getting ready. And now, here's Pastor John Gallinetti. goodness and merciful kindness thank you lord that we can come boldly to your throne to receive mercy and find help in time of need oh what a savior that we have jesus thank you for going to the cross paying the price for our sin for our sickness and for our poverty and lack lord we worship you as we dive into the word of god today that you would speak to our heart bring us where we need to be in you and change us in jesus name we pray amen amen hey just one more time You know, church is one of the most friendliest places you can be. Turn and shake some hands again. High five, fist pump, say good to see you, all right? Yeah? Yeah. (laughs) You know, um, uh, so I'm talking to this uh, realtor, and uh, um, <laughs> you didn't hear it yet, but <laughs> I appreciate the enthusiasm, um, and uh, we, we, when, when we bought this house that we had, an extra lot came with it, and uh, every day I'm calling it sold for top dollar in Jesus' name, and 898 days later, <laughs> it finally sells. So anyways, there's that. And so the realtor I'm working with, you know, I call her up, hey, I just got some questions about this and all that. Well, what are you doing for the, uh, what are you doing for the big weekend? I said, well, I get to go to church, and I'm so excited about that. I mean, think about it. In his presence is fullness of joy. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. In God's presence. I mean, the local church is like a piece of paradise in a chaotic world. Why would I want to be anyplace else? A couple of days goes by, I had to call her again and ask her a few other questions. What are you doing for the big weekend? I said, well, remember, um, I work weekends. And uh, when you're getting fired up to go on the boat and do all that stuff at the cabin, whatever, I'm putting on my game face. I'm going to church. Oh, that's right. You said that. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, I'm glad I'm in church today. Amen. Yeah. It's exciting. We're learning the Word of God, and we're in a series on generosity. How many know that when you get born again, you become generous? You become generous. You want to be strategic with it, but you become generous. Now, um, in Luke chapter 4, after Jesus fasted 40 days, he came out of the, the wilderness and into the synagogue and uh, his first message, he opened up, and that famous scripture that says, and the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor and to heal the brokenhearted. And, and there's like five things in there listed in his mission that the Lord gave him to do. But what was really interesting to me as we're talking about generosity, and I think you th- find it interesting too, that the very first thing that he preached was to bring people out of poverty and back into productivity for their community and for themselves. The Bible says as long as King Uzziah sought the Lord, God caused him to prosper. And true prosperity is being rich and on fire for God. Amen, church, like you are. But then when it gets on the inside, it will ooze on the outside. Turn to your neighbor and say, it will ooze on the outside. And there's no need to be afraid of the blessing of God. For the blessing of the Lord maketh rich and adds no sorrow with it. There's no strings attached. God loves it when you're blessed. And when we're blessed, we can be a blessing to the nations of the world. You see, true blessing 
us being a channel to advance God's kingdom and message is really the heart when it comes to being generous. And so, just a few takeaways from last week is that we found out that nobody, nobody ever has a money problem. How many remember that? We talked about that. How many remember that when we talked about that? Okay. There is no such thing as a money problem, just an obedience problem. And obedience to the laws and commands of God and obedience to the laws of stewardship and saving and not spending everything that comes into our life. And so we learned a lot about this stuff. But, you know, I noticed that the moment you get born again, we become generous. And the most generous person of all is God himself. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his only son. Heaven gave its best. I'm so glad he did that he didn't give a dog or a cat or a gerbil to die on the cross. But he gave his son for, for my sin and my lack, and my poverty, and, and, and my shame, and my disease. And wow, what a Savior. We were singing it before. Well, think about it. If it really sinks into our heart, what a Savior we have. That He redeemed you out of the clutch grip of sin. That means He pulled you out of lack. He pulled you out of poverty. So Jesus' very first point in His first message after he comes out of the wilderness from fasting 40 days and 40 nights, picks up, says, the Spirit of God is upon me. For he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to get them out of poverty. He bought us out of lack. He redeemed us out of poverty and being productive in their life. You know, after he, he shared that message in the synagogue, it was his first message. Again, the first point to preach the gospel and to deal with poverty that, that people in that synagogue turned to one another and said, is not this Joseph's son? Is not this the Home Depot of the day? Is not he the carpenter? And they were offended in what he said. And after his, see, now we never hear this stuff. It's very important, you see, um, because Jesus wasn't always welcome. You welcome him. I welcome him big time. He changes our lives. But he can only change those who open up to him. After that message, that whole multitude took him to the brow of a hill, really a mountain, and wanted to push him off. Wow, what an opening message, huh? And what a result there. Well, I'm glad I came to church. How about you? Amen. He bought your lack. He bought you out of it. And so when we become generous, it's really a byproduct of being born again. And the moment we get saved, the new nature comes within us. The nature and ability of God comes and is deposited on our inner man. Now, you and I are a three-part being. We've kind of said this a lot here, but just kind of reinforcing it just for a quick second, is that, you know, the real you is a spirit. You have a soul, which is your mind, your will, where your attitudes are formed. And then you live in a house, a jar of clay, a tent, so to speak, called a body. Now, when you got born again, you became a new creature in Christ. Paul says, old things have passed away and all has become new. You're a new creature. In the Greek, that means a new species of being that has never existed before. All of a sudden, the Bible comes alive to you. You want to pray. You want to seek the Lord. And guess what else? You want to become a giver. You become a giver the moment you get born again because the nature of of the greatest giver of all comes and resides on the inside of you. And so ye are of God, little children. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. All through the Pauline epistles, Paul talks about the greater one residing on the inside of us. Here's the point. Is that the moment you and I got saved, God's gracious nature came and is now on the inside of us. And the Bible talks more about giving than any other subject. It's really stunning than any other subject. And it's interesting also that Jesus taught more about money, our attitudes toward it, stewardship and things of that nature, than any other subject in the four Gospels. And so it's just really stunning when you think about that. And people really deal with those issues as well. But uh, when, when the new nature comes in us, we become givers. Back in the uh, late 90s, how many remember the late 1990s? How many of you were there? 
<laughs> went on a, I went on a mission trip, me and we, uh, Wendy, um, with um, a man by the name of Lamar Boschman. And uh, we went to Argentina and also to Uruguay and doing worship seminars. And one of the stops was in Argentina in a maximum security prison where criminals were there serving a life sentence. And we heard that there was some, maybe about 200 to 300 inmates that were going to be at this worship seminar that we had right in the center outside, surrounded by the walls where we were going to be. I remember when I walked in, the team of about 20 of us went, and we walked in, and, and, and the inmates were so excited that we were there. And I was surprised at their passion and fire for God. And one of them I hugged. They came up, they just hugged, hugged me. And uh, one of the persons turned to me and said, John, do you know who just hugged you? Um, before he got saved, he killed his wife with a pipe. I said, okay, thank you. <laughs> and so... Um, these guys were so fired up that we came that now not all of them but about a hundred of them gave up their meat they got meat once a week they gave which was chicken that day they gave up their meat that we could have lunch and so we had this big lunch together with about 100 to 200 really 200 inmates all there serving life sentence and then we had the worship seminar. I thought that I went to heaven. Their passion and fire for God was like, like lightning. It was incredible. But what was really stunning to me is that when I came away from that, I thought they gave up. They get three meals a day and meet once a week, and they chose to give us that meat that they had to be a blessing to us, and we came to bless them. I thought, wow, how generous of them. Really didn't have that much. But what little that they had, being in prison, they gave to us. Why? Because they got saved. They were born again, and they became a giver. And that's what happens when you get saved. Um, the trip that we're taking to Nicaragua and helping build a church down there is really, really interesting. And we're partnering with Builders International to do that. If God is speaking to you, you still can go. You still can go talk to Dan Morrison. Wave, Dan, so people know who Dan Morrison is. You can talk to him, and uh, you can go. But I got a letter here, and um, we're, we're, we're connected with what's called Builders International. That's a team that we're joining with and partnering with um, to go down to uh, Nicaragua, help build the church, one of the churches down there. Um, but I got a letter, and they may always get letters from missionaries, all that and everything. I wanted to share this with you because this one is from a gentleman from Sri Lanka. And uh, just talking about generosity and uh, from builders as well. It goes into many nations and builds churches, rescues women from the sex trade and things of that nature. It says, Dear John and Wendy, but anyways, it says, Gripped with fear after his 18-year-old son suddenly died, Sunel's Buddhist family rejected him as they blamed God for his son's death. Heartbroken because of the loss of his son, Sunel couldn't turn to his family for support. So he turned to the Lord and found major comfort in Navina Church in Sri Lanka. Sunel is now a dedicated member of the church. He takes 100 gospel tracts from church each week to pass out on the train ride um, to and from work every day. He makes $5 a day, but the Lord prompted him to donate a family heirloom gold necklace worth $1,000 to the church's building fund. Even in the face of heavy persecution, Sunal stands firm in his faith in the Lord and continues to honor God. I just thought, wow, isn't that something? I mean, just think about that. If you got to hear, it's just, it's just really interesting. So the point is this, is that when you get saved, when you come to know the Lord, then he's in control of your stuff. And it's important to follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit to give when he says, to do that. And so now when we start giving, we set the stage for increase in our lives. When we give, increase happens. When we give, it's not decrease, it's increase. Say that with me. It's not decrease. 
but it's increase. Now, over in Proverbs, the writer of Proverbs says this, which was Solomon. He said, there is one who scatters, yet increases more. Think about that. That's a paradox. It doesn't make sense at all. There's one who scatters, yet increases more. And there's one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters others will be also watered himself. And so whatever we generously give or sow will be, according to God's word, multiplied back to us. There's one who scatters, yet increases more. Does make no rational sense whatsoever to my mind. Not at all. But it's God's word. Something supernatural takes place. These laws of increase that God has put within the earth and for us today that is absolutely amazing. It's amazing. I got a couple testimonies I want to read to you from uh, Mount Hopers. And um, the first one here, uh, says this. Four weeks ago, I felt a tug on my heart and following the prompting of the Holy Spirit in your giving. I felt a tug on my heart to give a certain amount of money. It was money that was designated for something else in my budget. But I just knew God was going to bless me and take care of my need, so I gave it. Ten days later, I received an unexpected check for four times the amount that I had given. God, this is... Just, and I'm sure you've heard of testimony. You've experienced it yourself. And then he goes on, he says this. A week later, I planted another seed in the area of a need I had. Two days later, I received an unexpected, unexpected money again. This time, it was 10 times the amount I had given. And then he says, getting on God's financial plan works. I will never stop planting seed into God's kingdom. Man, don't ever do that. That's right. Yes, that's awesome. How many want to hear another one? Well, your enthusiasm wasn't that good. <laughs> he says, Pastor John, let me tell you how God has blessed our finances. For the past two years, I've had a job that paid a little, uh, a little, just a little less than our monthly bills. Even when it looked like we did not have the money, we always tithed first. God always made things work out. Money came in from unexpected places. Three weeks ago, a former co-worker called about a job he had seen on the internet. This job uh, is with a company that is a supplier to my current employer. I looked up the job and found out that I had all the job experience they were looking for, so I applied. The manager of this company recognized my name and immediately called me for an interview. After a very informal interview, I got the job. The blessing of this job includes a $5,000 increase in pay, a 401k plan, tuition reimbursement, and an opportunity for advancement. I am convinced that because we tithe and give the Lord what the Lord asks of us, that God blesses us, that God blesses us with this opportunity. Thank you for teaching about tithing. We've not heard this before we came to Mount Hope and how you can't outgive the Lord. Turn to your neighbor and say, you can't outgive the Lord. You can. You can. It's so awesome. It's, it's just so awesome to be a giver and to sow seed, to tithe, and to give offerings, offerings and to help. And so, over in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, it says this in verse 6. It's Apostle Paul writing. It says, but this I say, he or she, when the Bible says he, it means she too. He or she who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Now, we don't usually use those words. But what that means is when we give little, you'll get little back. And it goes on and said, he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as a purpose in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. How many glad you're a cheerful giver? Amen. See, God loves a cheerful giver. A cheerful giver. Not one that gives is, oh my God, where's it going to? I can't, oh my gosh. <laughs> but that you're cheerful in your giving. And we're all growing. We're all expanding. None of us have arrived. So, you know, we're, we're all growing in all of that. So the, the, the sweat and pressure is off you. But anyways, it says this, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you. You see all of the positives, not negatives that happen when we begin to sow seed, when we become generous with our stuff. It's, it's not a subtraction. You may feel it's a subtraction when it leaves your hands, but no, all of a sudden you put into the laws of increase in your life when you begin to sow. It says that God is able to make, watch this, you tap into more of God's grace. God is able to make all grace abound toward you. I don't know about you, but I need more grace in my life. 
all grace. So when you give, you tap into the grace of God. You tap into that and, and a lot of it. It says, able to make all grace abound toward you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every great or every good work. Then it goes on in verse 10. It says, now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply, watch now, supply and multiply. There's a multiplication factor. Supply, he supplies you. see Everything that we have in our life it comes from the Lord. Everything we have, the air we breathe, our lungs, comes from the Lord. Everything. So he supplies, then he multiplies what we give away, the seed you have sown, and will increase the fruits of your righteousness. Now, we mentioned last week, and it's always good just to reinforce, that you are the captain of your ship. There's no pressure, okay? You're the captain of your ship. Once you get revelation on the inside of you about tithing and about giving offerings and prompted to give and help people out, it only gets better and better and better for you. But at the end of the day, you are the captain of your ship. And we mentioned about James Tiberius Kirk last week. How many were here last week here? He's the captain of the USS Enterprise to search out strange worlds, to go where no man has gone before. Okay? That ship, as powerful as it is, will not move one iota, one inch, until Captain Kirk says what? Engage. Say it with me. Engage. Oh, come on. Have some fun today. It's Memorial Day weekend. Stand up with me right now. You can't. Okay. One, two, three. Engage. Oh, that's good. That's good. Some of you are just now standing. Lord, help my back. <laughs> it's good. You get to work. Okay, ready? One, two, three. Engage. God bless you. You can be seated. So the moment that we engage, God also moves as well. That ship will not move at all. And so God doesn't force. He works with us. Now, when our generosity is connected to the local church and the Great Commission, is when the lid comes off. It's when the lid comes off. Notice that trusting the Lord and being generous with your time, talents, and treasures leads to major increase in our life. In our life. I want to direct your attention to Mark chapter 10. And there's a story here of the, uh, the rich young ruler. He was young and he was rich. How many know God's not against riches? He's not against the riches. Matter of fact, the Bible says that he'll give you the power to get wealth. It's put within all of us. And we know that money, the love of money is the root of all evil, but not having it. You see, getting the right balance on that. Because you're the ones that are going to reach this area with the gospel. Everyone say, me. me. <laughs> yeah, you. And so the gospel's free, but the pipeline costs some bucks. I would love to take the pastor's minute on 16 different radio stations. But it's not, it's not prayer. It's not, and there's no pressure. I'm just sharing my heart. It's okay if I share my heart with you. It's not, thank you, I will anyways. But it's, <laughs> it's, it's not a matter of prayer. It's a matter of, of money now. And thank you for everyone who stepped up to do that as well. But watch now. Um, God's not against you having money. He's against money having you money having you and either you have it or it has you and jesus said only one will be your master see i know people they can't come to church because they're working and they continue to work i understand maybe for a season but when it goes on to five years and you're working on sunday i mean geez, man and so um everyone faces that temptation i did when I first got saved, I was in high school working at Jet Gas Auto Wash. And the owner, his name was Dan, a nice guy, but he was like pig pen. He, he, was, he, was, he, he smoked so much pot that when he walked by, it's almost like I got high. I'm just like, remember pig pen and the penis? I was like that. He was a nice guy. Well, I got the job at Jet Gas Auto Wash. I'm a senior in high school. Remember, I had my, my 350 Cutlass engine raised in the back, mag wheels, raised white letters on the, on the rims, on the wheels. Oh, yeah, baby. Woo! And so, anyways, and so I come and start working. He says, well, you got to work on Sundays. I'm just a new believer now. I said, oh. After the third Sunday morning I missed church, I felt, 
I need to be in church. How many have ever been there before? You know, you, I need to be in church. Man, I can't be skipping out. It's, it's, it's the best day of the week. And so I, I went to Dan and I said, and I said hey, boss, um, is it okay if I come in? I really want to go to church. And I just had a heart to heart with him. I really want to go to church on Sunday morning. And then after church, I'll whip right over here. And I didn't know what he was going to say. And he looked at me, you know, you need to do that. You need to go to church. I said, dear God, you do too. <laughs> you know. <laughs> you, you, need to, you need to do that. I said, I do. I really want to. And I'll come back. I'll come right after church. I'll be here. Okay, you do that. That's okay. And so praise God, I found favor. You know? I was able to share with that guy. I don't know if he ever got saved, but man, that guy smoked so much pot. <laughs> I mean, literally, you know, you just, and people do that because they're empty. I'm not condemning that. The scripture says not to do it, but why do you need to do that when you got the Holy Spirit? And it doesn't kill your brain cells, it doesn't kill your body. We're not going to go down that line because, you know, I ain't got medical marijuana and all that. You know, you can get healed today. If you're on dope, you can get healed today in Jesus' name. You don't have to get into that. You don't have to give into that. So here we got, here we got a rich young ruler in Mark 10, 17. You probably know the story, but here we go. It says, now as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that's God. You know the commandments. Jesus is reeling them off. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he answered and said, Teacher, all these things I've kept from my youth. So I thought, you know, wow, this guy, he's close. This is good. I mean, man, he's young and he's rich. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, one thing that you lack. How many know when you think you're hitting the ball at the park that Jesus always notices another thing? It's not that he's getting down on him. He wants to bring him into true generosity. He wants to bring him into true generosity, which is not trusting in your stuff, but trusting in the living God. And it goes on. He says, Jesus looked at him, loved him, and said to him, one thing that you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have, give, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Come, take up your cross and follow me. But he was sad at the word and went away, sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter into the kingdom of God. Now this struck the disciples like with a, because the, they, they knew the, the covenant of prosperity and the covenant of wealth, the covenant of the blessing of God was given to the Jews. How many Jews do you know today, whether they're right with God or not, they know how to work with money and they run businesses. They teach their children, don't work for the business, run the business. Okay? And then the disciples were astonished at his words, verse 24, but Jesus answered again and said to them, and he clarifies it now, children, how hard it is for those, oh, I see, who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. Then he says this, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to be saved and to enter in the kingdom of God. Okay, so w when I first got saved, I actually thought that, and maybe you were like this too, is that a camel actually going through the eye of a needle. You know, a needle, a needle like this, an eye of a needle. But that's not what it is. The eye of a needle is a real small door next to the gateways to any city back then. Okay? It's a smaller door. So it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to be saved. Because on that camel was all sorts of materials and stuff and things of that nature. And you had to go and you had to take everything out. It's kind of like going camping, you know. You go camping, you set up, and dear God, okay, we're going to get done. Let's have the campfire. And by the time you leave, you, you don't even get any rest. Because you're doing so much. Just a thought. I, I just thought that maybe there was an analogy there that could help you. <laughs> okay. And so anyways, so you have to take it all off. You got to pull it all off the camel. You got to push the camel down. You got to hit it in the butt 
to get that, that camel to go through that eye of needle. And so what Jesus is drawing a reference to, it is, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of needle than for a rich man to be saved. Why? Because many people have their trust in their stuff. And Proverbs tells us that that stuff can take wings and fly in a moment of time. During the recession in 07, 06, 08, 09, many people lost money. Many investors lost money. It could take wings and fly away. I don't like that when that happens, but it happened. In verse 26, it says, anyways, it says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were, now watch this, they were greatly astonished. So first they're astonished he's saying this, and now they're greatly astonished. Saying among themselves, who then can be saved? Question mark. Because if you had boats in that time, plural, you were considered rich. If you had donkeys in that time, you were considered rich. Now, many people think donkeys are just... <laughs> we won't say it in church, okay? <laughs> All right. But, but, they, but, but donkeys are actually really smart animals. Very smart. And they'll, they'll, they'll start braying if there's a fire or something. They'll kick away other things. They're actually really smart. And so it's kind of like turkeys. People think that, oh, you call people, oh, you're turkey. And I get it. You look at the outside of a turkey and all things. I was red garbage, blah, 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 all that stuff and everything. But, but turkeys, turkeys are very smart, and they can see for, for long ways at a distance. And they're just, it's interesting. Thank you, Pastor John. I appreciate this animal seminar today that we're at. Okay, here we go. And they were greatly astonished now, saying among them, who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, with men is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. Now here's Peter's bold question. He's always putting his foot in his mouth and saying things, and then Jesus' jaw-dropping answer to Peter's bold question. Peter began to say to them, we've left all to follow you. How many glad there's always someone in the bunch that's going to say it? It's just going to put it between someone's eyes and just say, how many are appreciative of that? You're just going to say it the way it is, man. I love men like that, don't you? Say it the way it is. At the right time, not at the wrong time. So Peter's saying, hey, man, we, we've left all to follow you. There is copious evidence in God's word that when you make sacrifices for his kingdom, that he will bless you and reward you, not only in this life, which is great, but more so in the next life. What you sow and give away in this life not only positions you for increase and for God to bless you, to channel and become more of a blessing, but also there are rewards stored up in heaven. Amen. And up there, there's no rust. There's no bugs. There's no flies. And there's no mosquitoes. I think mosquitoes are from the curse. You know what happens when a mosquito bites a Christian? They fly away. Yes, there's power in their blood, power. That's corn. I know. It's kind of like a Dixie cup, Christian Dixie cup, isn't it? But anyways, how many glad you came to church today? Okay. And so, <laughs> okay. So Peter, Peter began to say, man, we've left all to follow you. What, in other words, what's in it for us? And obviously we, we give because we're just so grateful that our names are written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. I mean, come on, man. We, we give because we were all rascals, and he's washed us with his blood. But it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop there. He wants you to be blessed beyond your imagination. What? Me? Turn your neighbor and say, yes! Yes! Why? So you can advance the message of Jesus Christ. That's why. That's why he'll prosper you. He'll bless you. And you ain't got 70, 80, 90, 120 years to do so, and then poof, you're gone. Your, your jar of clay drops, and your spirit and soul detaches from that thing and goes home to be with a God. Isn't that awesome? You can have your cake and ice cream and eat it too. Woo! I love it. That's why I'm so fired up for the Lord. It's just great. We can pray. He'll answer. We can seek him. His presence fills us. What are you doing this weekend? I'm going to church. Oh. Oh, you don't sound too exciting, my realtor. You don't sound too excited. Whoa, whoa. I said, what are you doing? I'm going up to the lake on the boat. Well, good. Have a good time. But I'm going to have a better time than you. Amen. <laughs> well, while you're in the church blessing the people, I'll be thinking of you. I'll be thinking of you too. <laughs> I said, you need to come to church. Well, where are you at? Embry Road, Mount Hope Church. Look up online. You'll see it. You'll love it. Anyways. 
So Peter asked this bold question. Finally, getting back to the message. So Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, after Peter's bold question, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters, plural, or father or mother or wife or children or lands. That's real estate. That's real estate. my sake in the Gospels, who shall not receive that's not in the Bible. Is that in the Bible? Mrs. Rosa Rosa, could you read this please? Sure. Are you okay? Yeah. You're not nervous? No. You're, you're okay? I'm, I'm okay? How many love class cooperation at Mono Church? Okay, could, could you read this just so they know it's not just coming, it's in sure. the Word of God. Sure. Which part am I reading? Is your hair really red? I mean, is it naturally red? Or you... It's not naturally red, no. It's really like, wow, here I am, you know? It's really cool it's looking. You picked me out, right? You know what? No, it's because I love your personality. Why, thank you. Okay, so do, do, you, do you see where I said to read just so? Okay, why don't you start right here? Verse, verse 29? Yeah, and then read verse 32, just so you know. Okay. Can they hear you? See if they can hear you. I have a pretty loud voice. I you do, you voice, do. So I can... You have a mom voice. Go I ahead, mom, mom voice. voice. Bolt it out. So Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels. Who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. Thank you. You're welcome. Give Mrs. Rosa Rosa a hand. You did a great job. So, a hundredfold, now in this time, in this time, not just in the sweet by and by, but in this time, right here and now. This is where we need it, right here and now. In this time, a hundredfold. And in the age to come, eternal life, then one other thing I don't like, with criticism. <laughs> That's persecution. People will pick it, oh, you just one of those Christians, whatever, you just, you know, all good things happen to you because you say you serve God, and, you know, you just, <laughs> How many ever met those people? They're always really interesting, aren't they? And so, this is, this is what he said. So, the issue with the rich young ruler was that his trust was in his stuff. And so our trust, which we, it's real basic, needs to be in the Lord and not in our stuff. And then Jesus gave the bold proclamation to Peter's bold question, what's in it for us? And Jesus answered a hundredfold return for those who make great sacrifices for his kingdom okay now in our generosity we need to thoroughly understand that god is deeply sensitive and concerned about what belongs to him the tithe is a discretionary amount that god has set in his word in his two covenants that is very sensitive to him and it belongs to him. The offering is a non-discretionary amount. It's just, you know, it's, it's something that you feel prompted to give. And so, when our gener in our generosity, we need to understand that God is deeply sensitive and concerned about what belongs to him. The Bible tells us that God has established tithing to teach us always to put him first. Always to put him first. And we learned last week as well, I just want to reinforce this, that tithing didn't start in the law of Moses. It started in the Garden of Eden when God said, I I, that, that one tree belongs to me. You can have and eat of any other tree, but of that one tree in the middle of the garden, that belongs to me. Okay, 430 years before the law was even established on tithing, Isaac, or excuse me, Abraham and Isaac are tithing. So tithing is an eternal principle established way before the law of Moses was even, even in sight. 
Now in Deuteronomy 14, 23, it says this, the purpose of tithing is always teach you always to put God first in our lives. And the point is this, that um, if you can put God first in your money, then he has your heart. He has your heart. See, he has your heart. Because tithing is a hard issue. It's a hard issue. Heart. Heart. Listen to this. Matthew 6, 21 says this. I love this version. It says, for your heart will always pursue what you value as your treasure. When I first heard about tithing, I thought, oh my gosh, yes, absolutely. I never struggled with it. I never questioned it. I said, I'm, I'm going to do it because my heart, I treasure the Lord just like you do. And when you treasure the Lord, at the end of the day, it's all His. It's all His. Like you mentioned before, even the very breath that we breathe. But that 10%, a tithe is 10%. It's not five, it's not two, it's not three. It's 10%. It belongs to God. Now, when we take that 10% and we consume it on ourselves, regardless of the reason, we put ourselves in complication. We can't be bold and ask the Father to provide for us if we've taken what belongs to Him and spent it on ourselves. So, God wants to be our source of supply. The tithe is holy unto God. It's holy unto God. It's not mine. It's not yours. It belongs to the temple treasury. It goes to the functioning capabilities of the local church. So the local church can keep pumping out disciples for Jesus Christ and doing soul-winning events, you see, and, and to reach this entire region and around the globe with the gospel. And so tithing also shows that God shows to God that you recognize that all gifts are from Him. Everything we have, like I mentioned, is from Him. Now, when we tithe, we're giving back to God what rightfully belongs to Him. And it's so sensitive and such an incredible thing with the Lord that he says, will a man rob God in Malachi 3? And they said, what? Where have we robbed you? And God says, in tithes and in offerings. And he says, this whole nation has robbed me. That's what he says, the whole nation. He says, return unto me, and I'll return unto you. So the number one way that we return unto God after we repent and invite Jesus Christ to come in our life is what we do with our treasures, with our time, with our talents. And so, you know, I've, I've over, over the, the course of 36 years preaching the gospel and even like five or six or seven before that, I've come across Christians who have really strange ideas when it comes to the first fruits of the tithe and all of that. And so... It's really interesting, but, but I'm here sharing with you that if you want to see the blessing of God upon your life, you want to obey God, you want to see that, Amen. then put him first in your finances. Put him first. It's what I call the, the black and white revealed will of God. And so let me, let me go there really quick. So we mentioned in Malachi 3, for I'm the Lord, I do not change. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. For the days of your fathers, like we mentioned before, you've gone away from my ordinances, have not kept them. Return to me and I'll return to you. Return to me and I'll return to you. Say, where and shall we return? He says, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. Now here's the thing. How can anybody rob God? Think about it. He's beyond an octillionaire. How can anybody rob God? It's not so much that God needs your, your money. He needs your faith and obedience so he can bless you back. It's, it is fundamental Christianity to give God the tithe. It's just fundamental. And so when you cross that threshold and you consistently begin to tithe and give him and honor him with it is when the lid is taken off. Until you begin to tithe, that lid is shut up over the finances of your life. Now, like we mentioned before, it says 
Well, man, Rob, God, you robbed me in tithes and offerings. Um, you are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. So the curse here means complication and destruction. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty like, wow, destruction to those who do not tithe. Now, it doesn't mean that God doesn't love us. Does, nothing like that. It's just letting us know that the tithe is holy unto God, and it belongs to him. So in other words, the moment you get paid, the first part, if the Lord is your treasure, you want to get that into the, into the local church as quickly as possible. Thank you for your enthusiasm this Sunday morning. <laughs> okay, now this is, what the, this is what the book says. It's what the book says. So if anybody has, a, has, has an issue, not meaning you because you guys love this stuff and all that, right? <laughs> if, if anyone has an issue, they don't have an issue with me. You have an issue with the Word of God. You have an issue with the Word of God. And so it goes on. Everyone say, let's get to the good part. <laughs> okay, watch the lid come off now. He says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me on this now. So the, we can't test God in any other area except this area right here. He says, try me on this now, says the Lord of hosts, if I not open up the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there won't be room enough to receive it. I don't know about you, but I like that. I like that. And if you're a genuine Christian, man, you'll love that. God becomes your source of supply above and beyond who, who you even work for. And so he goes on, he says this, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And so when we tithe, the lid comes off. When our generosity is connected to the local church and the Great Commission, the lid comes off, and now blessings can flow. And again, you have an open window over your life, your financial life, because of what you do with God's tithe. If you take it and spend it on yourself, the law of prosperity is canceled over your life. doesn't matter how hard you work. But if you honor him with it, windows wide, shoo, they're open. So either closed or open. Again, you're the captain of your ship. You're the captain of your ship. All right? Then he said, I will stand against the devourer. I will stand against. You remember that song? Can't touch this. <laughs> and he'd wear those real puffy pants. Man, that was a cool song. Can't touch this. Dun, 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 dun. What was his name again? Gosh, I can't forget. <laughs> wow, you heard of him. <laughs> MC Hammer was cool. And I like him, and he can't touch this. You know, when you tithe, the devil can't touch your stuff. He may try, but he can't. He can't. He can't. Because God's sitting there saying, no. And you'll find your tires lasting longer. Your refrigerator going farther. You'll go where no man has gone before. Okay, now the original Hebrew. How many, how many fired up became church today? The original, <laughs> the original Hebrew, the Old Testament written Hebrew, the New Testament written in Greek, says this in Malachi chapter 3. Put on your seatbelts, man. This is how good it is. It's great. He says, present as an act of worship. This is the original Hebrew. Present as an act of worship the full tithe, the whole tenth of your income. Can you see me over there, Dan? Okay. Present, it, present as an act of worship the full tithe, the whole tenth of your income, bringing into the storehouse so there can be meat in my house. Now watch what it says here. And prove me now by it, one. Go ahead, put me to the test, two. Try me, three. Check me out, four. I like that one, check me out. Experiment with me, five. Give me an opportunity to prove myself, six. I challenge you to challenge me, seven. Can I just read it one more time to you? Is it okay? Because sometimes we forget... We forget like 78% of what we hear in 24 hours. It's interesting. That's why you constantly get, it's like combing your hair. You got to renew your mind, okay? All right. It says this. Present as an act of worship the full tithe, the whole tenth of your income, bring it into the storehouse, which is the local church, so that there can be meat in my house and prove me now by it. 
go ahead, put me to the test, try me, check me out, experiment with me, give me an opportunity to prove myself. I challenge you to challenge me, and you will see that I will open the windows of heaven for you. Oh, glory to God. I will release the floodgates of heaven and pour out upon you financial and material blessings until you overflow with abundance. Wow. We're positioning ourselves for increase, amen? And when we're generous and we sow seed, it positions us for God to bless us so we can be a channel to help people out. So with what I do with the tithe, which is God's tithe, it's not mine, will determine whether I have an open window or a closed window. It's really black and white. It's really simple. Okay, so you today either have an open window or a closed window and your direction in your heart as it relates to the tithe. Say, well, it all belongs to God. It sure does. But he is very sensitive and very concerned and very detailed. One thing I know about God, he is extremely organized and extremely detailed. He takes it very, very serious. Some carnal believer, whatever, be careful of them. Ah, tithing stuff, all that stuff. Just... Don't listen to that. You listen to what the Word of God has to say. God's Word is the final authority. Okay? And so how many glad you came to church today? So we're learning, we're learning about what belongs to God, being generous. And my generosity begins when Jesus comes in me, the heart of a giver comes in me, where my treasure is, where my heart is. And so it begins by tithing and giving the first fruits to God. And the law of prosperity and increase is canceled off from my life when I take what belongs to God and I spend it upon myself. But when I honor God with it, He now goes to bat for you. He now goes to work for you. The favor of God is on your life. Everyone say, the favor of God is on my life. So understand that God's love is totally unconditional. He loves you. He loves us. And uh, one person say, well, I go to hell if I don't tithe. The answer is no. But it will send others to hell because of the message that costs money to send that message out. The missionaries that we're supporting right now, how many want to advance the gospel in India? Man, I do. You see, Nicaragua, and all those nations, you see. So God will bless you so you can be a blessing. Now, the Word of God says this. Can I have just a couple more minutes of your time real quick? We'll wrap things up. You go have your burgers. When we tithe, we're giving back to God. Again, what already belongs to Him. Now, Deuteronomy 8.18 says, Remember the Lord your God, for it is He that gives you the power to get wealth. Okay? New Living Translation says this. Remember the Lord your God. He is the one who gives you the power to be successful in order to fulfill the covenant He confirmed to your ancestors with an oath. He gives you the ability to produce wealth. He gives you the power to produce wealth. Okay? So that, that he's put that on the inside of you. All right? So God always has an abundant mindset. Always. He always has an abundant mindset. And so when we tithe, the, the curse is reversed. You reverse the curse and the lid comes off of your finances. The lid comes off. All right? Now, let's wrap things up by just looking at some takeaways from today and last week real quick, and we'll wrap it up. Here's some generosity takeaways. I just thought I wrote it out. I thought it was cool from today and last week. Number one, I'll honor God with the tithe first and foremost, always with everything that comes into my life. He's my source of supply. Number two, I will challenge myself to give offerings as the Spirit of God prompts on my heart. See? I'll give offerings. Number three, I will start a safety bucket. You say, what's a safety bucket? A savings account. Why? Because life happens. Our washer needed to be fixed. There was a... God, what is that thing? The, um, anyways, there was a thing in that our washer that just went bad, stunk the whole house up. I mean, for three days or so, oh my gosh. And then they called us, the parts on order. Oh my gosh. 
So they come out, they, they, they fix this thing, and um, it's just, you know, the way it is, and guess how much? $354 to fix that baby. But I have a safety account. I have a safety barn. I have a, there's your, your uh, income bucket, your safety bucket, and your growth bucket. Investments, things of that nature. Safety bucket. So I said, Wendy, it's a safety bucket time, isn't it? It's a safety bucket decision. I can tap it over, pull it over, pay that off, no problem. And so why save? Again, because life happens. And we talked about the 118 plan. Give God what belongs to him, and then, or he's moved toward it. Tithe 10%, save 10%, or invest it, however you want to do it, and then live off of 80%. Don't live off of everything that comes into your life. The wise man stores up for the future. See, if you don't think about your future, who's going to? And let me, let me encourage you. You might be here today or listen to me online, and you might be in debt up to your nostrils. Up to your nostrils. I have good news for you. If you start on God's plan today, and don't buy everything your little BDI wants to buy. I talked about Home Depot. When I go into Home Depot last week, I said, every, it's like I want to buy 13 things and I do not need it. It's just like, it must be a spirit or something. I don't know. It's just like, I want to, oh, you don't need that. No. So you got to just say no with me on three. One, two, three. No. No, no you don't need it. No. You've got to say no so much to yourself if you want to put yourself where you're heading toward the wealthy place. One candy bar, not three. I'm being real with you. Say no. Well, I meant... I meant <laughs> Turn your ear and say, I've never had so much fun in church in my life. Wow. Okay, so you start an emergency fund. If not, work toward it. It will help you because life happens. Lawnmower breaks down, something breaks down, and you won't be under such pressure. But start now, and if you're in debt... Begin to, I, there's people who have come to this church, I love it, and were in debt up to their nostrils, and now they're totally out of debt. It took them time, but they learned about the law of tithing. They start tithing, and then they started into debt reduction, chip away at that baby. I said, just chip away at it. Little here, little now. Little here, little now. You can't go up north on the boat like you want to right now, but that day will come when you will. Chip away at it, chip away at it, chip away. Four years later, three years later, they're totally debt free. Because they work at it. And this must be one step at a time. Don't get discouraged. It can be, when you're in debt, it can be so discouraging. Amen? It can be so discouraging. If you just take it one step at a time, and ask God to be a wise steward over your stuff. That is just as most important right underneath tithing, is, is using wisdom with your stuff. You don't have to buy everything, like I said, your little BDI wants to buy. If you have to go to goodwill and get stuff to get by it, that season will pass, and you will come into a greater place. Amen? You will come in, but you got to be wise in doing that. Wow, this is good stuff. It's like a seminar today, isn't it? Jeez. And so anyways, I love this stuff. Understand the law of compound interest. The law of compound interest says if you start today, you start when you're young, that interest will work for you in, in 20 years. I tell my kids right now, if you start saving and investing right now when you're 18 years old, by the time you're 38, you can be a millionaire. Huh? Yeah! But you can't go out and get the fastest car on the planet that burns up 100 miles to one ounce of fuel. You know, whatever. You, you can't do that. You've got to just conserve, put your, and God sees that, and he'll work with you. Wow, what is it about this? This is powerful stuff. You see, put yourself in a position where you've got to restrain for now, but it's delayed gratification where it's going to get you to the point that you want to be. And for me, it's to be able to write big checks to the kingdom of God. Amen. It's to help. And I remember. Anyways, and so, so a safety bucket. Live on 80%. Good work ethic. Good work ethic means this. I'm going to do my best on the job because the Lord is my boss. And I'm going to honor who I work for too at, at the place of my employment. I'm going to be the best worker they've ever had. I'm going to be the best worker. 
Might not start out that way, but I'm going to be. When I left Paul Faden Sons Hotel Restaurant Institutional Supplies specializing in pizzerias, Jerry the foreman came to me and said, I wish you wouldn't leave. You're one of the best workers we've ever had. I said, I could have used that encouragement two and a half years ago. I said, Jerry, thank you so much for sharing that with me. That means a lot to me, you know. Be a good worker. Go the extra mile on the job. <laughs> give me nothing, I'm gonna give nothing back. Then you won't have nothing. Jesus said, what? Go the extra mile. Go the extra mile. Anybody can pick up that gear and go one. Go two miles. Go two miles. Live on a budget. Everyone say budget. budget. It's not sexy. It's not sexy. It isn't. Are you here today? It's not sexy. Budget, budget. Live on a budget. Because we're an American. We live in America. We got everything. And we want everything. And we feel if we don't have the latest and the greatest, we're a nobody. And that's wrong. Our value is in our relationship with the Lord. And life is short. Life is short. Number seven, be a wise steward. People don't have a money problem. They have an obedience problem. Number eight, write out, I'll get into this stuff. Write out your financial dreams. Write out, get a dream book. And just go home today and write out 20 dreams. Oh, I'd like to have a cottage up north. On that one lake that really has huge bass. I'd like to do that. Just write it out and watch how the Lord, and when you have a goal, how God will direct your steps. Something supernatural goes into operation when we have faith goals. I'll share more about it. And finally, the last one is believe God for big results. Now unto him it can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that works in us. That power is the Holy Spirit. Now unto him who can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or even dare think according to the power that works in us. I want to encourage you to think big. To, to think big. Bigger than where you're at. Not just for stuff you can have, but how you can, and that's okay, that's good, but how you can advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. Wow. I often think of the scripture in 2 Corinthians 5 that says we're all going to stand before the Lord and give an account of the deeds that we did in this life. And I'm so thankful for the blood of Jesus, how it's cleansed me. Because I've made some foolish decisions years ago that, that, that you know I've been pulled out of. Man, I'm so grateful for God's grace and that His mercy is new every morning. But I live in 2 Corinthians 5 and I'm going to stand and give an account, not just of my faith, but how I deal with my money. I'm going to give an account to the great steward himself. How I talk. A lot of believers mess their financial prosperity up because they, they're still talking like the world. Well, another day, another dollar. Did you, you see what the news said? It's all coming down. No, nope, I'm going through it in Jesus' name path of the righteous goes brighter and brighter until full day. The world can say this, God's word is greater than that. It's not denying the fact that the stuff is happening in the world. It's the fact that God is greater than what's happening in the world, and he'll lift you above that. He'll lift you above that. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for sending Jesus to die a miserable death on the cross that we might know you personally. Lord, we're getting serious about this stuff. We're getting serious about generosity. We're getting serious about being a wise steward. We want to, Lord, because we want to be positioned to fund the end time harvest here in the last days. God, thank you that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Thank you that eternal life has been deposited on the inside of us and that we know beyond a shadow of a doubt if our heart would stop beating, we have a home in heaven. Thank you for the incredible gift of eternal life, Lord. That's for all who ask you for it, a free gift, no strings attached. So with their heads bowed, right now, I want to ask you a simple question. You're here today. I know a lot of you are saved. You love God. Those watching online, 
If your heart would stop beating, where would you be? There's only two places. There's heaven and then there's hell. There's no purgatory. There's no soul sleep. There's nothing. It's hell or it's heaven. And us going to heaven is what we do with the person of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer, those here and those online watching, that if you never call a time, we invite the Lord to come into your life. Today's your opportunity. Today's your day. Because he loves you and he cares for you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whomsoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Say it with me, dear God in heaven. I admit I've broken your laws and commands. But today I'm coming home. Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of all my sin, all my mess-ups. I boldly confess that you're my Savior and my Lord today and forever. In your name I pray. Amen and amen. Now I pray a blessing over your life. I come against the spirit of poverty and the spirit of lack, and I break it over your life in Jesus' name. I pronounce God's blessing of increase, favor, and even prosperity over your life. I pray that you'd become a wise steward, positioning yourself for great increase in your life. I pray that no evil would befall you, neither any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you, keep you in all your ways. A thousand will fall by your side, ten thousand your right hand, but it will not come near to you because you're in covenant with the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for all your blessings. Thank you for the men and women who sacrificed their lives, Lord, on foreign shores for our freedom that we have in this country. We honor them and we thank you for them. Pray for our police department and our policemen that you'd protect them, direct them, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name. Pray for our president, Lord. May the wisdom of God be upon him. We thank you, Lord, for revival in America. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Whew. Praise God. I'm fired up. I'm fired up. I could keep going. We got to shut this thing down. Um, How many are having hamburgers today? Tomorrow? Oh, you got hot dogs? Barbecue chicken? Are you still a Detroit Lions fan? I hope they go to the Super Bowl next year. That'll be great. You talk about increase. That'll be awesome. God bless you, everybody. Have a wonderful day. We love you. Altar workers will be up here if you need further prayer. We invite you to join us in person at Mount Hope Church in Grand Blanc, Michigan. If you'd like more information about Mount Hope Church and Pastor John Gallinetti, visit our website at mhcgb.com. Thank you.